For many, many decades, this was the luxury hotel of downtown Denver. Top of the top, this was the place you came if you were rich or famous or influential. The Brown Palace is special for a number of reasons. I mean, it's the iconic hotel here in Denver. It's got history beyond history. This is where it's at if you just want to really hone in to what it means to be a part of history, but also to have a great experience at the same time. The skylight in the Brown Palace is one of a kind. I take pride in fixing, repairing, restoring my prior generation's work. You just never know what's going to show up in the lobby. Try and imagine two 1,500-pound animals right by the concierge desk and all the rodeo royalty in their sequin cowboy hats, only at the Brown Palace. I think when you walk in here, you can't help but feel the spirits of just decades and decades of sojourners that have been here before you, just kind of layered upon the place like the different styles of architecture. There's a real magic to it. This program was made possible by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional support from these organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. Long considered an oasis of elegance, Denver's Brown Palace was ahead of its time from the day it opened in 1892. Located in the heart of downtown, this hotel was once considered the finest west of Chicago. Few could rival its splendor and who's who in America guest list. This legendary hostelry is a time capsule of architecture, technology, and of the growth of the west. When Denver began, it was a classically ratty little town. It was thrown together. There was a discovery of gold in the late 1850s, 1858, and then a rush, Pikes Peak or bust rush. And that was very significant. People were running around making claims and running out of town. Nobody even knows at that stage whether it's going to last. Denver had become pretty much just a rest stop, a supply town between that long trip across the plains and heading up to the mountain gold camps. If you're going to try to reconfigure Denver as a commercial center and the queen city of the plains and so on, you really have to have accommodations for people who come in. Once you have a train, they have to have a place to stay. Nice hotels are probably the most potent statement that you can make of saying, we're here. Henry Curtis Brown was on the scene here in Denver the year after the big 1859 gold rush that gave Denver and Colorado its start. Henry Brown not coming to prospect for gold. He is a builder and a businessman from Ohio, and he's coming to mine the miners because the miners are going to need places to stay. Henry Brown and his wife in 1860 were actually on their way to California and they stopped here in the brand new dusty city of Denver and the story goes that she said to Henry, you may go on to California if that is your wish, your son and I will go no further. So it was because of her influence that Henry ended up settling here in Denver and ultimately changing the face and the fate of the city. Henry Brown was primarily a real estate speculator in the early years especially and one of the first things Henry built here in Denver was a boarding house down near Cherry Creek. Building along the rivers, not so smart. There's a flood, the big one in 1864, is a huge lesson and it does seem like H.C. Brown was one of the people who got that lesson with particular clarity. When Cherry Creek flooded, he decided to seek some higher ground, literally, and homesteaded a 160-acre plot about a mile southeast of where Denver was growing up around Larimer Square. 
People in Denver said the city will never ever reach that far out and they called it Brown's Folly. But Henry was nobody's fool. In 1867, Denver was chosen over Golden to become the territorial capital of Colorado, due in part to a very generous donation from Henry Brown. Henry helped to seal the deal for Denver by donating 10 acres in the middle of his homestead property for the new state capitol building because he was so generous and civic-minded and shrewd. Henry Brown's homestead became our Capitol Hill development. He charged a premium for those lots. That was the beginning of his fortune. Henry Brown was really ahead of the game. It was one thing to arrive early in a town's settlement, and it's another thing to know where you want to put your time and effort to capitalize on that opportunity. As the decades rolled on, he got involved in the Denver Pacific Railroad, the Denver Tramway Company. He had his own newspaper, the Denver Daily. He was the president of the Bank of Denver. He was one of the founding members of the Chamber of Commerce. Henry's contributions to Denver's business boom would culminate with a magnificent nine-story structure, the tallest in town at the time. Built on a triangular plot of land, Henry not only financed the elaborate construction, he poured himself into every detail. In the end, the Grand Hotel would be an architectural marvel that would forever bear his name. As the capital began to rise, they realized they were going to need a very impressive hostelry, much closer to that, for visiting dignitaries, etc. What is really cool about the Brown Palace is that it's quite a maverick piece of land. This nation and westward settlement in this nation was all about rectangles, all about right angles. This is before the famous Flatiron Building does it, a similar kind of thing in New York City, so very innovative. Because he made it a, a right triangle with a five-sided, basically, hole in the middle, our atrium lobby, that allowed for every single guest room to be an exterior room. The architect of the Brown Palace was Frank Edbrook. He was from Chicago and came here to Denver in 1879 at the request of Horace Tabor, our Silver King. Frank Edbrook ended up staying here in Denver and designing or at least contributing to more than 60 buildings in the city, some of them still the finest in town. Not only was the Brown Palace an architectural gem, but it was also a technological wonder for its day. The Brown Palace is featured on the cover of Scientific American Spring of 1892. It was remarkable for its fireproof construction with all of the superstructure being iron, steel, and concrete. And then in the floors and the interior walls, hollow terracotta block, a type of ceramic. Tall buildings really could be death traps. They advertised it on our letterhead for years. Absolutely fireproof hotel. <laughs> if you look at the exterior of the building on the first floor, you'll see a Colorado granite. And then the rest of the building is sandstone going all the way up to the roof. The Brown Palace has been described as Romanesque and also Italian Renaissance. There's elements of both in the design of the building. Ancient Roman villas were often built around an open center courtyard called an atrium. Frank Edbrook just took that idea eight stories high. The Brown Palace was started in 1888, completed in 1892. It took four years to build and lots of artisans who made the Florentine arches and the decorative wrought iron panels on all our open balconies and the mosaic floors that used to be throughout the hotel. All kinds of craftsmen from all around the world contributed to this building and that's why it took a while to create. It's hard to find a mistake in some of the stuff that they've done, like the stonework. And the stained glass was just an integral part of it. I just don't think they're the craftsmen and skilled laborers to construct a building like this today. Up on the seventh floor level, in between the arched windows are medallions. And within those medallions are carvings of Colorado mammals, 26 of them. There are deer and elk and mountain lions and bears and bison and rabbits and sheep and all kinds of things. They were done by an artist named James Whitehouse and we call them the Brown Silent Guests. The most original part of the hotel is obviously the atrium lobby. 
As people come in immediately, their eyes are drawn up 100 feet to that stained glass skylight, which is just absolutely stunning. 1892, that was unprecedented, and it became known as daylighting the interior space because of the natural light that comes through the skylight. The skylight is suspended between the eighth and ninth floors and is not actually on the roof. A transparent gabled window above allows in natural light while protecting the skylight from weather. Stained glass has been a Watkins family tradition for over two centuries. My grandfather and great-grandfather put it in and my dad and I worked on it and then I, I've been working on it since. I was involved pretty much from the time I was seven till now. It's 65 years. It's really pretty amazing how high quality things they turned out. That's what amazes me. There wasn't any clinkers in there that turned out junk. It was all top quality stuff. Henry Brown spared no expense to ornament his 400 room hotel with the finest materials and furnishings. The onyx that adorns the lobby and the second floor onyx room. It's uh, very rare and was mined in the city of Torreon, Mexico. You just simply cannot get this stone anymore, so it's very unique to the Brown Palace. The china from Royal Dalton and Black Knight and Limoges, all the silver pieces were custom made by Reed and Barton. The finest linens, the finest lace curtains, just top drawer throughout. We generated our own electricity, we made our own ice, we had our own well water. It was just almost like a city unto itself. Every suite of rooms from the beginning had hot and cold running water, flush toilets, shower baths. All these factors combined from the moment we opened, we were considered by many one of the three best hotels in the nation at the time. Right up there with the original Waldorf in New York City and the Auditorium Hotel in Chicago. But the magnificence of the fireproof hotel did not protect it from a fire sale. A year after construction was completed, the Silver Panic of 1893 wiped out many of Colorado's fortunes, including Henry Brown's. Because of the crash, Henry was forced to mortgage the hotel for a fraction of his value. And before he was able to buy that mortgage back, it was bought by Winfield Scott Stratton, who made his millions in Cripple Creek Gold in the 1890s. Winfield Scott Stratton, after he bought the hotel in 1900, invited Henry to keep his office here and to even live in the hotel if he chose. Just six years after selling his prized palace, Henry passed away at the age of 85 in 1906. His body would lie in state in Colorado's capital on the very land he had donated. He was buried in Denver's Fairmont Cemetery alongside his family and near his chief architect, Frank Edbrook. In 1922, Charles Betcher purchased the Brown Palace, ushering in a new era of family ownership that lasted nearly 60 years. A German immigrant, Betcher had built his family's fortune through multiple business enterprises, becoming a leading industrialist. Management of the hotel fell to Charles's son, Claude, who went by CK. C.K. Betcher basically piloted the hotel throughout the Great Depression, World War II, and right into the 1950s. And a lot of the physical changes that happened to the hotel happened under his reign as owner. One of the big ones was the change of the grand entrance from the Broadway side of the building over to the Tremont side because of heavy traffic. So they closed that entrance in 1935, but I think it's a shame because now when people come in the Tremont side, they sort of feel like they're coming in the back door, and they are. To get through the Great Depression, the Betcher family decided to convert the top two floors, eight and nine, into private residential apartments. In 1937, they were called the Skyline Apartments. Very prestigious, very pricey address. But the steady income from those permanent residents allowed the hotel part to continue operating without sacrificing any elegance or excellence. In keeping with the fashion trends of the 1930s, the apartments were remodeled in an Art Deco style. The nautical theme for the Ship Tavern, formerly a tea room at the Brown, was inspired by C.K. Betcher's collection of model clipper ships. 
Betcher's most dramatic renovation idea, turning the Brown Palace into a 26-story hotel, never materialized. As early as the 1920s, plans were drawn up to close off the atrium and erect a tower on top of the ground. But because of events like the Great Depression, World War II, there just simply wasn't men, money, material to pull that off, thankfully. I don't know if the Brown Palace would be in business right now if that addition was added because it just would have taken away the character of the open atrium. So instead of closing off the atrium lobby at the third floor and building a 19-story tower up the center, someone suggested building across Tremont Street. So our tower annex over there was built and opened in 1959 as the Brown Palace West. There's actually a service tunnel under Tremont Street that connects both of these buildings, and all of our housekeeping staff goes back and forth. Decades earlier, there was a service tunnel of a different kind. Across the street from the High Society Brown was a house of ill repute. The Navarre, also designed by Frank Edbrook, was originally built as a boarding school. But around 1900, the building was lost in a poker game to gamblers, who named it after Henry of Navarre, a French king devoted to decadent living. Not a welcome neighbor by the Venerable Brown, but this was the case all the way from 1900 clear into the 1930s, possibly 40s, depending on who you want to believe. And during this period, the two buildings were connected with a tunnel that ran under Tremont Street. It was actually a coal tunnel between the basement furnaces. According to legend, the coal tunnel doubled as a secret passageway to the neighboring brothel. From the beginning, we have attracted heads of state and royalty and celebrities, the social elite, the business and political movers and shakers. Some of our early guest registers actually have the signatures of people like Andrew Carnegie, Thomas Edison, Queen Marie of Romania, Charles Lindbergh. One of the Brown Palace's boasts is that every president beginning with Teddy Roosevelt in 1905 has visited the hotel. With two exceptions, Calvin Coolidge, and Barack Obama, who I always say has no excuse. <laughs> and of all those presidents, Eisenhower spent by far the most time here because his wife Mamie was a Denver girl. She grew up here. So all during Eisenhower's administration, they would often stay here at the Brown Palace and the hotel became known as the Western White House. Even presidential visits could not compare with the fanfare that accompanied the world's most famous rock band. In August of 1964, the Beatles stayed here when they played up at Red Rocks for $6.60 a ticket and did not sell out. The Brown Palace didn't want them staying here because they were the mop tops from Liverpool. They had this long hair and Denver was a pretty conservative town at the time. When they were expected, the block was encircled by five to 6,000 screaming teenagers. The poor Beatles had to be smuggled into the employee entrance and up a service elevator straight to their suite. We do still have a Beatles suite. It's been done in kind of 1960s style decor. All the prints replaced with album covers and posters, but the coolest thing in that suite is a jukebox that plays everything the Beatles ever recorded. More than 225 songs, you don't even have to put a dime in it. The hotel is both a reflection of the changing cultures it has survived, as well as the originator of some of Denver's more elite traditions. When you come through the doors of the Brown Palace, you are leaving a modern Western city and you are entering another time and place where you have elegance and you have beauty and you have the refined customs of afternoon tea. And it's just a magical place like nothing else in downtown Denver. The Brown Palace tradition that launches the holiday season for the hotel is our champagne cascade. All the furniture is cleared out of our atrium lobby and they build a pyramid out of 6,000 champagne glasses. It's almost two stories high when it's finished. A master swordsman who knows the lost art of sabering a bottle of champagne takes an antique sword and he knows right where to hit the bottle at the throat so that the 
cork pops out, but you don't lose all the champagne. He does this with four magnums of Mouet Chandon. Pours it in the top glass, it cascades down through the others, and even with four magnums, it never gets anywhere near the bottom of that pyramid. Since 1955, the biggest party that we host every year here at the Brown Palace is the Denver Debutante Ball. In fact, the uh, Debutante Ball are joint owners with the Brown Palace of our huge 25 foot by 25 foot LED chandelier suspended right in the middle of the atrium. It's spectacular. The debutantes come down our grand staircase in gorgeous white dresses, and then they have the first waltz with their fathers in the atrium lobby. The most unique tradition that we have here at the Brown Palace happens every year in January at the end of the National Western Stock Show. We exhibit the Grand Champion Steer. This silly tradition goes all the way back to 1945. Two Hereford bulls auctioned that year for a record-shattering $50,000 each. It made national news. Tradition was born. It's important to preserve old places like the Brown Palace because they're not just old, they are storied, they are iconic. This building to me represents a time in the past when important architecture added to the beauty and the character of a city. The changes that it made in the 1920s and the 30s to now, we always want to preserve the DNA, but certainly we need to be up with the technology. Like any grand lady of a certain age, there are problems with leaky plumbing and internal temperature control and <laughs> deteriorating appearance. <laughs> the Brown Palace has undergone many incarnations over the decades. An extensive renovation in 1995 revitalized the Victorian era in many guest rooms. The decors of Ellington's, the atrium lobby, and Churchill's bar were also transformed while maintaining their historical imprint. Two presidential suites were added with our last major redecoration of the top two floors in 2000, and the designers at that time selected two presidents from very different periods of Western history. One and my favorite in the Hull Hotel is the Teddy Roosevelt Suite, and that's done in Edwardian style 19 teens, lots of dark wood paneling and wilderness and wildlife touches because he was a hunter and a conservationist. And the other is the Reagan Suite, and that's done in California ranch style with mission style doors, wall treated to look like stucco. One of the big preservation projects that we just finished was a refurbishing of the outside of the facade of the building. That was a three year project, one side of the building per year. 180 tons of Utah sandstone was used during the restoration of the hotel's windowsills and exterior walls. Historical photos and construction drawings helped specialists ensure the existing facade would remain supported during the replacement. Over the years, Colorado's winters had taken a toll on the Brown's sandstone exterior. Sandstone is a really foolish material to use in this climate because after a few cycles of freeze and thaw, it gets very unstable, brittle, breaks apart, and over the decades we've lost quite a bit of elaborate raised stone trim that used to decorate the outside and has not been replaced. The hotel's silent guests in sandstone carvings were not repaired during the restoration project. Unfortunately, some of those are so badly deteriorated now you can't even be sure what animal they are. So I hope before too much longer there'll be some money for some actual artistic restoration and we can bring them back to their former glory. One of the artistic carvings includes a bas-relief of Henry Brown himself, ever watching over the hotel that bears his name. The value of historical architecture is it's a touchstone to the past. You're not just reading about it, you are surrounded by it. To stand on an atrium balcony where Margaret Brown may have stood after the Titanic disaster. To stand in front of the palace arms and take in the view of the atrium lobby that President Taft stood in awe of when he arrived. That's the sort of thing that brings it to life. The legacy of the Brown Palace is that it has always represented the very best that the city has to offer. 
And this has always been the place where deals have been negotiated, where milestones have been marked, where anniversaries and achievements have been celebrated. Things were built differently, things were built right, things were built to last. Sometimes I think we've lost a bit of that. The stained glass is just part of that orchestra that Edward put together when he designed that building. I feel really proud that people can enjoy things that I've made. And I think my dad did, and I know my grandfather Frank did. I think the Brown Palace is a place for an experience. In fact, I got married here in 2001. The place is near and dear to my heart. It's the repository of generations of memories. And I think you feel that when you come inside, not only what has gone in the past, but you are somewhat inspired to add your own contribution to the memories and the wonderful things that have happened here. <laughs>